Thank you very much, Nicolas. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you to the organizing committee. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you also to my good friend, Mario Bizzini. Seems like that's the, the phrase today. So <laughs> OK, um, so many great speakers, so many great talks. What can I add to this? Um, I won't show you too many numbers, but I want to go through a few things to see how actually easy it is. You just take the next exit. Um, if you had the right roadmap, and we've talked about roadmaps and all that. Um, but actually, it may be something like uh, a labyrinth, labyrinth that we need to navigate. And uh, because once you get in there, you have many choices. And when you're, at, when you're at the bottom end, or at the start of the process, you have all these possibilities in your RTP uh, route or roadmap, and it's difficult to decide. Of course, when you're on top and when you've gone through, and you look back, it seems easy. You have the overview, and, uh, and it all seems quite clear, right? So that only happens in Disneyland, <laughs> where these shots were taken not too long ago. So at this stage, you're wondering, what the is this? <laughs> what do we have on the right or on the left? Some of you guys know what we have on the left. Uh, on the left, that was last night's speaker's dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and on the right, any idea? Well, on the right is, I did an evaluation to see, am I ready to perform this morning? And this is my evaluation. <laughs> Going back to Tony's talk on concussion. Right, and you see, like at the bottom right, something's wrong with the slides, by the way, and that's a bit annoying. It wasn't before, we're missing some parts. But there's a few that are on the six or five there. Anxiety, you don't see it, but it's there. All right, um, any chance you can arrange the slides or? <laughs> oh, they see, okay, good, good, all right, perfect. Now, this was a, um, a conference on injury prevention just not too long ago, two weeks ago, and Nicolas was there. And uh, this is the president of the FC Sion. And he said, si le type veut jouer, il joue. Right? If the athlete says, I want to go, well, he goes. And that's the manager, president, coach, sort of, because he fires everyone who's not agreeing with his coaching moves, etc. <laughs> so you know that. All right. So what can I bring today? Well, maybe a little bit of an idea on how to, to ride the elephant. Ah, now you're wondering, well, what is this about? Some of you maybe, maybe know um, if you've read this issue of the, the BJSM in March last year. All right, so a few domains were covered. The top ones in blue have been pretty much covered yesterday and today. And the ones at the bottom, not really. We haven't addressed these issues too much. Now, I'll go over some of these pretty quickly. The ACL. Now, if I have a look at that picture there, and credits to Adam Meekins, the sports physio, for those uh, of you who know him, of Twitter fame. So from injured to recovered, this may be the route that we end up having as we go through the maze. But what does recovered mean? What's the percentage of recovery, or the percentage of success of that recovery? Well, Claire has given us a, a few numbers on that, return to sports, about 82%, to pre-injury level a little bit lower, to competition, 44%. That was in 2011. And there's an update, right, in 2014, it says, well, actually, it's 55%. So 55% return to competition. So that thing here isn't exactly correct, because it goes maybe a little bit lower in the end. And now if we look through time, Less than 24 months, we have these numbers, and different studies show different numbers, but the principle remains the same. If we look over 24 months, it plummets down. Of course, this is worrisome. Now, Mark DiCarlo told us about the, the RTP story, and here's my take on it, uh, to get to some understanding of how to ride the elephant. The RTP ACL 1.0, was, ah, uh, it'll take six or nine or 12 months. Well, then we look at some clinical parameters and physical examination, swelling, pain, then strength, 
and the indexes, and we've gone through these already. Then there's the 2.0, where we look at some more complex evaluation, power balance, hop tests, movement quality, and I don't need to comment on these. It's been brilliantly done this morning. 3.0, psychological factors, coming in strong in the last five years, finally, and scores. And Eric told us about the scores and how these may, may be quite important. Now, if we ask experienced surgeons what they do, Here's a study, you can see that will be done in 2103. So, <laughs> but I'm sure that from 2013 to 2103, we may have the same results. And I assume that this is a safe place to say that. Right, who's an orthopedic surgeon here? Sorry. <laughs> All right, so, and when we look at scores, Using no scores, it's that bar on the left. Now, we don't really know what score should be used, but we understand that probably some score should be used. Certainly, no scores is not what should be done, I guess. All right, so we're talking about complex multi-component evaluation, and I'm here for the Swiss session, so I'll give a few things relating to Switzerland. Um, on top, you have Geneva, the bottom, you have Bern, the Eiger. So some landmarks for Switzerland, I encourage you to visit if you have a chance and come and see me in Geneva whenever you can. Qualities that we have in Switzerland or sort of iconic values or you know, tools, we make tools. Teams, we have shared decision making in our politics, very important. Time, I'll try to stay on time, Mario. Expertise, so these are all required to process on the RTP and this is, um, an RTP score that was developed by my colleagues at Macklingen, Macquelin, Steff Meyer, um, and other colleagues, Lucia Kalber, who worked on this, integrating some of these elements that we discussed to, to a large extent in these past few days. So that's one potential score. It hasn't been used to the level of a potential validation. But probably that's what we should do and try to validate these a bit more strictly and see which ones are irrelevant, which one we could leave out, or which one we would need to use more definitely. And then the weighing of all the parameters in the score is probably very important. And then the weighing, in my opinion, is probably individual. So we shouldn't have the same weighing for every, fa for every factor for different athletes, but that's another story. Problems with that, it's only applicable to elite teams. In Switzerland, that would be the Swiss Olympic Medical Centers. There are 12 of these. It's functioning at an economic loss because you can't build sufficiently for all the infrastructure and all the people you need to do that. And this is the reality. We need, we need to, to say this. It's not scalable. And in Switzerland, we don't have any systemic health records that allow us to use that. Now, we need to set up a medical staff communication system. We need to set up databases. But I'll probably leave Ben Klaas and address that a little bit later today. All right, muscles and hamstring. Now, if we look at the time to RTP in this study by Martin, who's somewhere in here, great study, 44 days mean time to RTP. So this is what it looks like. Injury, and you know RTP about 44 days. And what we all know is that it's not really like that. It's more 8 to 80 days in this study. Can MRI be predictive? Analog talked about this yesterday. What's the answer? A resounding no. Okay, then on to Tony and concussion. So what do these athletes here have in common? On the left, George Smith. That was about a year and a half ago. No sound, you don't need, no sound please. Who had seen that before? Yeah. So it's just another one of those concussions, right? So obviously, who thinks he's concussed? Okay. Who thinks he's, he's fine, mate? <laughs> yeah, Tony. <laughs> All right. 
And Alvaro Pereira, who thinks he's concussed there? World Cup. Uh, who thinks he's not concussed? Okay, they all returned to play. We know that story. All right. They all did, and, uh, and Alvaro Pereira was pushing the doctor away just before returning on the pitch. And I mean, problem. So what has improved? And a few things have improved. Right? And criteria, and the SCAT, and video reviews, and tunnel doctors, and um, injury, head injury spotters in NFL, and all that. So it is improving at the management side. Uh, things are really moving forward. What needs to be improved is the attitude towards these issues. And I'm not going to go over all the ocular motor vestibular testing uh, that, that was shown yesterday. Monitoring elements post-injury. We monitor these scores, but what do we do with them? And they're not sufficient, but how do we actually uh, use them or other scores or other monitoring markers that we could have? Now, in the future, maybe they're going to be markers for concussion, biological markers. The few studies out there that look at uh, some proteins, some tau proteins, S100, post-concussion. Um, we're not there yet with that. Maybe one day it'll give us a, an idea about prediction of severity or about you know, how long we should wait before we enter a stage rehab or RTP uh, protocol. But we're not there yet. Now, maybe Will can help. If you can put sound on, please. Coming out soon, in December. All right, so why can this maybe help? Because there's so much hype around it, and sometimes we feel like, especially when we have events live happening, players returning to the pitch in the World Cup, well, it seems like it's normal, you know, they're just mildly concussed, they can return. Uh, maybe we are not very good at communicating these issues, and maybe some other people are good at communicating that. And these are pros at communication, communicating some issues. Now, I don't know what the messages are going to be. I can have some idea. Uh, probably not exactly evidence-based, but maybe it can help our cause and raise the awareness uh, about these issues. Because we all here feel and know a lot about concussion and how we should deal with concussion, even though the evidence doesn't help us so much for the exact protocols. But there's a lot of people out there who deal with concussions every day, who witness them, who coach kids, etc., who don't really know. So maybe this will help. In Switzerland, there's an expertise center that's uh, been started a, a year ago or two years ago, uh, University of Zurich and Schultes Clinic and Dr. Nina Federman, and they're trying to, to do a battery of tests and prospectively look at these concussions, and, uh, and so that's a good reference probably to, to watch out for the future. Okay, now what about overuse injuries? And I'll be very short on overuse injuries. Managing load progression and the tissue response or adaptation. And I don't have any napkin anymore, but uh, Ian talked about this before. Tissue health, tissue stress, that balance. And we can model that into the tissue uh, training stress balance model from Bannister. That's 1975. That's a long time ago. But it comes back out again, really. And it's being applied in elite sports to monitor loads on a weekly basis and average loads across a month and see how the discrepancy between the two can be predictive of injury or at least uh, of an elevated risk for injury. So simple things that can be monitored, f especially for overuse injury, could be uh, important. Not, not only for prevention, but also for going back, of course. How do you elevate the load and progress after an injury? Relative energy deficiency in sports. All right. Huge issue, issue if you have athletes in the aesthetic uh, sports or endurance sports. Uh, I recommend highly the, this paper from Margot Mondroy and, and the consensus group um, from last year. Based on, on Ian's model, the three stages to assess the, the health risks, the medical risks, and um, to, to subdivide into red flag, yellow flag, or green area, to train. Now you can have a look at these, but if you're in the red evaluation zone, we should have a contract with the athlete before they even enter a return to play protocol to decide on what steps shall be taken. And that's potentially interesting because there's 
concerning health issues with, with that. And if you're in the red zone, definitely we do want to have a binding relationship or contract to help them move through. Now, of course, if they're in the red zone, there's no competition, there's only supervised training, if medically cleared, and then we adapt slowly. The, the yellow zone, there's also some restrictions to training, and uh, only as they follow the treatment plan. So that's a nice way to put it, and it's been developed with the SCAT cards in mind. There's also a, a red a SCAT paper that was published. In Switzerland, we would need to create a network for this issue, and but there's no sports psychiatry, and we can't fund really nutrition and psychology, so it's difficult. There's been just a couple of weeks ago a paper in sports psychiatry as being inexistent and should be started uh, in the future. Myocarditis is a, a concerning problem. We tell athletes to stop training for six months before they can go back uh, and, and being cleared through different tests. We don't really know what the evolution is, and six months is a very long time, and after six months, they're deconditioned. Now, in Switzerland, there's a study that's starting now to look at these different elements and how they progress through the six months and then return to play. All right, now, I do have five more minutes. Well, okay. Ian told us that every prof professional thinks they know better, right? and that we should have a different look at t team decision-making. Now, here comes the elephant part. Now, Jonathan Haidt, in The Happiness Hypothesis, tells this metaphor about the elephant and the rider. The rider sits on top of the elephant and tries to ride the elephant with his rational mind, and that's our roadmaps, protocols, tools, measures, etc. But the elephant, if he wants to turn left, he turns left. The guy who wants to play, he plays. But his readiness, his motivational factors, psychological factors, which are more difficult to measure, are in play. And then media, fans, nations, television, etc., play a big role in that emotional aspect. In the book Switch, and there's a podcast that uh, Kareem did with one of the authors, the fallacy of decision-making is that one can rationally steer the elephant. Not exactly true. We need to direct the rider, so give proper criteria, but we need to motivate the elephant and shape the path for the two. How can we do such things? Well, athlete motivation and psychological factors, we've talked about it extensively, very important. Specific testing and maybe modern wearable technology that we measure some things on the pitch within the activity that give us a feedback or not, the lab tests or the so-called specific tests, but real specificity of tests that we can measure in the field. Analyze those data and have a human approach, as Robin Sadler told us. Um, now, maybe another thing is, can we wait one more month? We heard about Derek Rose waiting a few months after being cleared. Th there are other things behind it, probably, but if we wait one more month, once we decide, we all here decide, ready to play, but actually we say, you'll be ready in one month. We reduce the risk of re-injury by 24% in ACL. Why don't we wait one more month? Yeah, sure, there are pressures, but maybe that's something to keep in mind, 24% per month. Now, again, I'll go back and give credit to Adam Meekins for this, the injury prevention pyramid. Load management and strength training at the bottom, the most important. And then at the top, you have quackery and other things. Right? Now, can we have something about RTP? Now, I would say that RTP is about attitude, the right attitude. And there's the athlete on one side, and the athlete needs to be fit, and that includes all the performance tests, uh, the, the, the clinical aspects and all that. He needs to have team support, and certainly on the psychological side, he needs to have that support. He needs to have the right load pr of progression through the RTP. Maybe nutrition plays a role. Uh, he needs to have protection, uh, as in equipment sometimes can play a role in some phases. And he needs to have luck, for sure. We never talk about that, right? But it's not only the athlete, it's the manager also. And the manager needs to have health literacy. He needs to understand what we're talking about. He's not the doctor or the physio, but he needs to understand what we're talking about. He needs to empower the staff, as in us here, have the power to make decisions, have a look at the big picture, you know, the risks maybe in the long term, the financial risk, etc. communicate that with the athletes, have alternatives. In team sports, there are alternatives. We don't need necessarily that player in a week, maybe we can have some more time. Equipment, need to provide equipment and cash and lead to proper RTP. So that would be maybe my take on a return to play pyramid, if, if that means anything. Yep, 
1956, <laughs> thank you. RTP is an attitude, I would say, just a set of criteria and of rules. And, uh, and with this, I'm finished. Thank you. Perfect.